Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Compressed FM, a podcast all about web development and design with a little bit of zest. In this episode, we're going to talk about a new era of framework agnostic components. Web development and design, who would have guessed what we can do on both, even add a little zest. So turn up the volume, get ready for the best. Let's get it started in this episode of Compressed. What's up, everyone? My name is James Q. Quick, and I am a full-time technical content creator. Hello, my name is Amy Dutton, and I am the Director of Design at Zeal. And uh, we have another amazing guest joining us, as usual, in uh, Sammy from Builder.io. Uh, Sammy, do you want to introduce people or introduce people, introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh... Hey everyone, my name is Sammy Jabber. I'm a software engineer at Builder.io. Uh, I work on the product side of stuff there, but also the open source software side of things. And uh, yeah, the thing I'm coming here to talk about is something called Mitosis, which is one of our open source products at Builder that I've been working on for the past year or so. And I'm really excited to have more people hear about it. Do so there's like several things that are associated with builder.io. Like builder itself is a is a product, but then also kind of a, a parent umbrella for a few different things, I think. Can you explain to people like really quickly what builder is and then also like what these I don't I don't even know how you phrase it, like sub brands or sub products are? Yeah, for sure. Builder is a headless visual CMS. That's like the really short, uh, like a drag and drop headless visual CMS. Uh, it lets you drag and drop your own components. So you have like, your web app and you have all sorts of components and you want your marketing team to be able to build pages on the fly. You can use Builder for that so they can drag and drop the stuff that your web team created using this content editor interface. And then all of that works just out of the box, really flexible and all that. So that's, that's what Builder is. That's the product. Uh, but uh, Builder is, I think, kind of yeah, unique in that it also has a lot of open source initiatives. Uh, we're really interested in making like the web fast. So primarily like for our customers, we want our customers to be like to have a fast website because a lot of CMSs are kind of they can be like janky or slow or they just like bloat with a lot of JavaScript. We own Builder and be like, no, Builder is the opposite of that. And so part of that mission is uh, helping our users solve a lot of problems. One of the ones that we solved is third-party scripts being slow. And so that, you know, we don't want our users to be like, oh, you know, I'm worried about builders slowing things down. Third-party scripts are slow. We're like, okay, here's this thing called Party Town. So Party Town is this uh, open source project created by the amazing uh, Adam Bradley, who's a, a co-worker of mine at Builder. And it moves third-party scripts into a worker thread so that it frees up your main thread on the browser. Uh, essentially like a really clever trick to kind of offload uh, your, the main thread on your browser to make everything faster and, and all of that. And then after that, we're like, okay, well, what about first party scripts, which is like the actual web app that also slows everybody down. And they like, uh, you know, a lot of websites have much lower performance scores that they'd like, like we've kind of accepted a bad average for the whole web. Like we're just okay with like, you know, if 30 out of 100, and that's where Quick comes in. So Quick is a new web framework that is being built by uh, three folks of mine, three coworkers of mine primarily. So Adam, I've already spoken about, Mishko, uh, who is the creator of Angular back from his Google days, mm -hmm. and Manu. Um, all three are just like a rock star team. They're like incredibly brilliant. I can't pretend to know how the internals of Quick work, but just watching them talk and work on it is really, really uh, impressive. Um, and so Quick works, uh, it would be a really long tangent to like explain how <laughs> Quick works, but uh, there's some like foundational bottom-up innovation going on in how Quick functions at its core that make it very unique and very different from all of the other web frameworks out there. But we've made a ton of effort to make it look like really similar to everything else, just so that it's very familiar but under the hood is doing like some incredible things. And so that's quick. And then <laughs> the last thing is, well, what I happen to be working on, which is mitosis. 
So because Builder wants to service every single user, uh, whether they're building a React app, Svelte, Quick, SolidJS, Vue, Angular, and we want to allow all of these people to drag and drop their components, we need like specialized NPM packages, specialized like libraries that can handle those components. And we tried doing this the web components route early on, and we still have a web component SDK that is kind of framework agnostic, but we struggled with that on a few different fronts. And so from that frustration was uh, Mitosis was born, which is a unique take on how you can create a library for every single web framework that exists today without having to do it by hand every single time and without having to go the web components route, which at least as of now has certain limitations that we've encountered. And yeah, I don't know. I kind of <laughs> <laughs> went on for a while, but like, I, I think all these products are really cool. So I wanted to give them like, their due. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Amy is on mute is what I was going to say. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> uh, I've been looking at mitosis for a while. I'm pretty excited about that project because I've wanted to build components that I can share online. Now, help me remember, do you have to use like React or Svelte as a, use that as a starting point, right? And then you can run your scripts to export out whatever you need. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you're talking about yeah, using React and Svelte as a starting point. Uh, I think that's referencing the syntaxes that Mitosis currently supports. Okay. Um, so to briefly explain what Mitosis is, um, Fundamentally, it's a compile tool. So it does nothing regarding, like, it's not aware of what you're going to do with the output. All it does is you write a file in a syntax that Mitosis understands, and then it's going to take that, it's going to run that through a bunch of code, and it's going to spit out five different versions of that file. So you go from, like, a Mitosis file to a Vue file, a React file, an Angular file, a Svelte file, a Quick file. And the way it does that, well, we have to come choose a syntax that mitosis will understand. And we are not in the business of creating brand new syntaxes and like having to figure out like a linter rules and like a parsers for them and syntax highlighting and like build tools and just so much work goes on to coming up with a brand new syntax. And so we've obviously just looked at what people use today. We're like, okay, well, React is like the most popular framework and they use mm -hmm. JSX and other frameworks use JSX as well. So let's just use that as a starting point. And so that's why the first syntax that Mitosis supports is just a, a JSX syntax. Um, but it doesn't, it looks very similar to React, but there are some slight differences, some you know, different imports. You're not actually writing React code, you're writing Mitosis code that Mitosis mm -hmm. understands and can kind of like parse out. Um, so, and then the Svelte thing that you're referencing is a amazing contribution by uh, someone from outside of the builder team, Raymond, who, didn't want to write JSX, wanted to write Svelte because that's what he likes and that's what his team likes. He wanted to convince his team to use Mitosis and they're big on the kind of Svelte view-ish kind of template syntax. And so he put that together and kind of reusing everything that comes after the syntax can be reused, but you just have to create this parser for Svelte syntax and boom. So now we also have a Svelte syntax as of a few month, months ago. Um, yeah. So is it just... Oh, sorry, James. You're wah, good. Wah. Go for it. Are, are you just checking the templating on that or will it also handle state and things like that? It's, so it, it does a lot. Um, so to give you a frame of reference, like what, what is Mitosis used for wh where we are? Because we built it for our needs first. Mm -hmm. uh, we use it for our SDKs. So we use it to power the software that like a lot of our big enterprise customers at Builder use every day. And so we use it to, so it involves, you know, like fetching some data and then passing that through context, through state, muta mutating state, uh, you know, dynamic styles, static styles, all of these kind of things that you'd expect to be able to do when you're building a component, this idea of a component, we support all of that. So it goes a way beyond just, you know, like a template and some styles. It, it can mm. do a lot more complex stuff uh, because like I said, you can also like hold on to references to, components outside of mitosis and then render those dynamically, which is what the SDK does. Like the consumer of the SDK can say, hey, I have this random counter, like a clock component here, take it and then render it. And it's, you know, it's able to do that even though 
the initial code is written in mitosis. Very cool. I think it's really interesting. I, I don't know if I, I quite had this understanding in the previous episode. So we talked to Adam Bradley, I think Amy grabbed the link. It was episode 78 about Party Town, Quick, and Builder. And like, first of all, the naming of these things is so exciting. Party Town is just super fun. And then I get lots of comments all the time on Twitter of like, you need to try Quick, which is on my radar. It's just out of the million things that I want to spend time with, I haven't spent um, spent time with it. But it was really cool to hear your explanation of basically all these products came from innovations really of trying to improve this core product of builder and solving problems by creating solutions yourselves that you can then like share with other people i think that's such a good such a good idea for people to have um and especially with the idea of open source as well like create these tools so that like we solve our problems and other people can benefit with them on top of that and obviously that comes with a lot of work and responsibility and like maintenance and that sort of stuff um but it just seems like such a cool idea it makes so much sense like hearing you explain here's the use cases for why we came up with these products mm -hmm. you mentioned like kind of the goal with mitosis would be inside of builder people could kind of bring in like any type of components they want to can you help me like relate these two back to each other again so mitosis will like you can write your source code, export out these different kind of component frameworks and then bring them into Builder and then have the drag and drop interface for those those components. Is that right? Ish. Um, <laughs> so I think like, yeah, like trying to explain mitosis can usually like tangle people up because then trying to tie it back to Builder starts to get a little like, yeah, like weird with all the like the framework agnostic stuff happening. Um, essentially, uh, you have a Next.js app, okay? You have your Next.js app, you write React code, right? Like that's like the most typical web app environment today. Um, yeah, and you're writing a bunch of stuff. You have your five or 10, like you have your button, you have your link component, and they're all styled neatly. And then you have a coworker on the marketing team, someone who's not technical is like, okay, I wanna edit like these two, just like this section of our homepage. And so, instead of doing what you usually do, which is what changes do you want? Okay, <laughs> tell the designer, get it on Figma, blah, blah, blah. You just remove all of that, replace it with like import render content from builder.io slash react. So you get like, you, Im you import the NPM package, that's a React library, and you can't tell that there's anything related to mitosis mm. beneath that. You have no idea. It's just a React library. You import the, com the component from there. You do all the initialize, you give your API key, you give it the properties that it's need and you put it to replace all of that code. And then you set up builder, your coworker goes on builder.io slash whatever your team's web like organization is. And then they'll be able to create that content. And then inside of the headless, uh, the, inside of the drag and drop editor, they'll see the page mm -hmm. and it's all going to communicate with the SDK. You're going to be able to, drag and drop your custom components because the SDK relays that back to the drag and drop builder. It tells it like, oh, I have these like this button, this link, blah, blah, blah. That's what I, that's what I can play with. And so the drag and drop editor knows and it can kind of be like, okay, put that one here, that one here. So as far as the user's workflow is concerned, they have no idea that there's something called mitosis. Yeah. Right. Which is cool. Cause that's what you want. Cause the main reluctance we might have is like, oh, well, what is this? Like, what is it going to do? What is it going to add? How is it going to impact people? Like, nothing. All they're gonna see is an NPM package that like looks literally like a human being would have written a React component or a Vue component. Um, unless like there's some, you know, so there's some crazy edge cases where there's no feature parity between all frameworks all the time. But you can just look at this code and it makes sense. It doesn't have weird artifacts from mitosis. Cool. How does does, how does this factor into like the cross-platform story? Because I see like the output for mitosis, like you get into something like Swift, which is like a totally different ecosystem. So Swift is for iOS development for people who haven't done that before. Historically, it was Objective C, then Swift came out as like a modern alternative to that, similar to what like Android with Java and then Kotlin led to. And there's I've kind of learned more about the ecosystem recently with like cross-platform tools does this factor into like the idea of right once target all which includes deploying to to mobile applications as well 
Uh, yeah, so the Swift output, I'd say is like on more, a lot more on the beta, maybe let's say alpha side. Okay. Um, yeah, it's something that we've played with just because found fundamentally, it sounds like there might be something we can do there. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that we currently use, but it's just something we've played with. Uh, we have a React Native output. Um, so that kind of, in a way, ties into this like cross-platform story that you're talking about. And we have React Native SDK for Builder that is generated with mitosis. Um, and so that's something that, that exists. Uh, but yeah, like uh, Kotlin slash SwiftUI is something that we've thought about and played with a bit, but there's still like some interesting, tricky challenges that you'd want to be able to solve that don't involve you just like shoving JavaScript and evaluating JavaScript mm -hmm. inside of native code, which is, you know, slightly subpar. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we have React Native and that's, that's something I think it was really cool. Like you have, we have a single code base. And so I'm, I'm the SDK, like a lead developer on the SDK side. And that's why I'm also the one working on mitosis. And so to have one code base that is generating your SDKs for Vue 2, Vue 3, React, Svelte, SolidJS, Quick, and then React Native as well. And all of them are working in tandem and like getting feature parity in tandem is in kind of mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it's, not, it's not like the easiest thing in the world, but I bet you if I had to copy paste all of that by hand, then it, it would probably have to be a lot more than one person <laughs> to like kind of steward these efforts if you had to constantly keep six or seven code bases like mm -hmm. in tandem and you fix one bug, you have to fix it in seven places and hope to God you didn't kind of mess it up. How like, how does an on mount work in Svelte versus a quick versus in React? Because they all have the same concepts. Like all of these, I mean, I know we came up with quick, so like obviously there, there's a lot of differences and there's a need for all of these different frameworks, but the way a developers authors a component is not that different as much as we all like to think that you know our favorite web framework is like the really special and like amazing one and it's so different from everything else but like the fact that you can get like something that works pretty much the same with one source of truth is kind of your proof that they all kind of have the same underlying principles underneath all of that syntax that might be different so do you like write that inside of a package.json file? So you're like, anytime I compile, I'm just going to have it run the mitosis script and crank all that stuff out. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the, the step that doesn't really exist, maybe super out of the box yet in mitosis. I think it's kind of like, it's like a library, but not a build tool yet. Mm. Even though everyone wants mitosis, like a lot of people come up as like, can mitosis just do everything for me? <laughs> I'm like, okay, we're, we're still at the stage where we want that engine that generates the code to be really powerful and cover all the edge cases. But yeah, when you, so you kind of have a lot of steps where you first, you write your code and then you have this like mitosis build CLI command and it has this configuration file. So you tell it like generate view two and view three and react and uh, you know, have all of these plugins to do these special things. And then once you do that, it's going to spit up, spit out like six different folders, each one for all six outputs. But then from there, you kind of still need to have your like Vite build tool or like Webpack <laughs> or whatever it is that you want to use. You still need to have like a different package.json for each one of those six outputs because you kind of want to treat them as if you wrote them by hand. Mm -hmm. And so what would you do if you had six things written in by hand? Well, each one would have its own package.json, its own build command, its uh, own I like see. NPM package. So there might be like a distant, like a longer term future where, um, you know, we have all of that just magically just like hit build and it all just Boom. happens. But there's <laughs> so many edge cases around what you'd need to build each one of those that we currently want to just give people the flexibility to do it the way that they prefer. Yeah. It's, it's still so cool. Cause I mean, from what I've read with um, mitosis is that there's certain library with the, each library, you each have your boilerplate and your specific specific way of doing something. That's the felt way or the react way or the view way. And the fact that you're able to say, there's no reason for somebody to maintain all that. We can do that for you. And it's just brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, it all comes down to this 
it's like an assumption that has been true so far, kind of. That's like the whole underlying reason why mitosis works is because saying, well, is there a way that we can represent the abstract concept of a component, like a UI component? Can we represent that in a JSON object? Mm. Can that happen? And if it can, then we can kind of say like, well, the component has a name. It has a bunch of states. One of them is called foo. Another, another of them is called like bar. And then like, that's the initial value. And then there's like a function that does this. And there's context that you set, context that you get. And then there's like, you can just describe all of these things in a JSON. And then if you can just map each concept to the right syntax in each framework, like in Svelte, a context is this way. In view two mm -hmm. is this way. In view three is this way. And so far that's been a success. Um, and that's what makes it really, yeah, it's, it's really surprising almost that like every concept can kind of map to some hook in some framework, which kind of tells you that all of these framework authors are all like, you know, they, they're trying to solve the same problems. Like we're all trying to set some state, set some styles, set some like HTML elements and give them attributes and then mutate things when other things change. And I just described kind of like 90% of what components are. There's of course, like, you know, mm -hmm. some edge cases at like the very edge of what you want to do. But what I just listed is like, that's 90% of components that exist probably. And yeah, it's easy to map that from framework to framework. I'm so glad you've kind of hit on that point a couple of times. Cause when you first mentioned this idea of like the similarities con conceptually between frameworks, I wanted to jump in and like double down on that. Cause that's something I'm like really adamant about and like, <laughs> have this epiphany every once in a while when you look at like any product from a series of different companies regardless of whether it's tech related or cars or whatever they all evolve in these like same ways mm -hmm. so if you look at like any car from any um any car make i guess um across like across the board in a given year and then look at those same set of cars across the board in five years they've all made like very very similar changes so this idea that like these frame like people are very opinionated about which framework is best, et cetera. And like, obviously have your opinions on like which one you prefer, but they all at the end of the day are solving similar problems. And from a teaching perspective, I've had this conversation a few times recently in, in discord. Like I recommend people learn react just for higher ability for like the amount of jobs that are out there, the amount of resources, the amount of time that like react shows up on a requirement for a job, whatever. But but the big thing is like learn the concepts, like learn, learn what React is doing for you. And one of the ways you do that is by starting it, in my opinion, with vanilla JavaScript, like work with the DOM and figure out the limitations of that and understand like what are the benefits with the framework. And then to be able to recognize like those similar concepts across the board, I think is really empowering for developers as a whole, because the concepts to me are always much more important than the specific syntax or like memorizing a syntax for a given framework. 100%, yeah. I think that's like a, a privilege of working on something as kind of esoteric and unusual as mitosis as I got to, <laughs> like, a privilege slash burden of having to yeah. learn uh, like six frameworks in a year because yeah. I've, I've only done React before. Like I'll be honest, mm -hmm. up until I started working at Builder, I've only written React code and React was my only doorway into web development. Like any other framework that came before React, I was like, I did not understand how these people yeah. actually like, wrote UIs that went into production with like the stuff that came forward. So I'm incredibly grateful that React kind of paved the way for like this new era of like very component-based stuff. But uh, but yeah, it's been cool. Like you just learn like Svelte and then Vue 2 and then Vue 3 and then Solid and then Quick and uh, and all of these. And you look back and it's, if you squint hard <laughs> enough, you're like, yeah, it's just, it's the exact same block of JavaScript code inside of a thing called on mount in this one or use effect with an empty dependency array or use client effect in, in quick. And it's, it's just all wrapped in slightly different ideas, but it's all the same concept because mm -hmm. what we all want to do when we build UIs is actually pretty similar. That hasn't changed. Like the fundamental experience of being on a web page has not changed that much. Yep. Um, so let me ask a, Maybe hot take question. Uh -oh. What's your favorite? I was going to ask that too. That's such a good question. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't be 
really lying if I said none of them. Because, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm, I'm joking, obviously, but like, yeah, working on something like generating code for all of these frameworks, all the only thing that comes to mind is the frustration with like the edge cases that I encounter <laughs> on a day to day. Mm. Um, obviously, from I'm definitely very biased, but uh, from the fact that I've seen all of the work that's going into Quick, I think that it's like a tremendous like. There's just so much crazy stuff going on in there, um, but I I like all of them. Uh, there are so, there are so many interesting things about each and every one of them. Um, I like this felt syntax to me is initially something I found kind of weird because I was just like JSX is how I learn web development, and then yeah. I got to use it. I'm like, oh, that's kind of neat. But I I can get into that. Um, like the view is also similar in that way uh, with like the newer API that I personally like more than before, but. You know, at this point, they're all kind of the same to me um, mm -hmm. because I kind of see I'm, I'm used to like just thinking about how they're all similar rather than different. Mm -hmm. So the differences to me are like tangential uh, and not that important to me. So I've, I've had I have a side project that I worked on last week and I started it with uh, Svelte and then I was like, oh, I encountered some problems. I'm like, you know, I'm just going to try using it in Quick instead. And I like moved it in like maybe... 15 minutes, I just copy pasted all the code and made the changes. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, I like that more. I'll keep it this, this way. It's, I, I think I, I, I really like the fact that I've gotten that comfortable kind of like moving around yeah. rather than mm -hmm. getting too bogged down. Because um, I've seen, I wasn't there when React was first announced, you know, like I joined the web world after when it was kind of like, this is the thing you should do, mm -hmm. you should use. And it's really funny to me to see like people who are really raging over the idea of JSX it's 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 amazing it's really amazing to me that people can have such a strong opinion about it's just you know it's just syntax just deal with it do it it's not it really it doesn't it shouldn't impact your life that much um yeah i don't know long winded answer but uh current last side project i built was with quick and i like that yeah i uh, think so much of it too comes down to the community because like when i think about all the different options i also think well if i did it in this particular framework I don't have access to this package or this plugin or whatever so it's kind of interesting that those are the things that have almost started to define the framework is mm -hmm. not just the specifics you have inside of it and the structure that it has but exactly. what yeah. what are the other pieces that you can pull from well that's actually really really funny that you point that out because that's I think that's really strongly related to mitosis because if you kind of look five years ahead, if you imagine a world where like mitosis, you know, keeps getting stronger, fixing all of its issues, gets into like this um, case where it's covered a lot of cases and people have started building on top of mitosis more and more. My kind of wish or hope is that what you just pointed out would no longer be an issue mm. because it's essentially this idea of an ecosystem. It's like, okay, I'm going to use React because it has like Chakra UI, it has like a framework motion, it has all of these mm -hmm. complicated libraries that take a lot of time and effort to put together. But then the flip side of that is it's such an enormous shame that these people have invested so much time putting together these few resources. And at the end of the day, they only work on one framework mm -hmm. when they really don't need to, because there is nothing special about React or like any of the other frameworks that makes Chakra UI or Framework Motion only work in React, mm -hmm. right? They're all just using the DOM. Um, and so, yeah, there is a world, I hope, where more and more people build equivalents of these in mitosis. And we get to a place where people are like, oh, wait, I don't know. This idea of an ecosystem around web frameworks is not a thing anymore. Like, uh, I mean, Chakra UI the, I, that comes to mind because it's uh, author, he's, you know, they've created the view version now. And, He's working on a similar-ish idea to mitosis called uh, Zag.js. Not similar, it's like a finite state machines that are framework agnostic. So approaching the problem from a different kind of angle. And uh, because, you know, probably realize, well, why are people are not using Chakra UI everywhere because I've only written it in React and I don't want that. I want everyone to benefit from my like hard work. Uh, but yeah, ideally, I think, I mean, my ideal would be for so many people to use mitosis and build powerful framework agnostic libraries that you end up in this world where eco uh, web frameworks don't just stick around because they have an ecosystem, but they only stick around because they're the best at what they actually do. Mm -hmm. And 
I know we're all tired of JS fatigue and this like, especially <laughs> right now, it's insane how many web frameworks there are and how they're all moving so fast. But my take would be that if mitosis succeeds at its mission, we would no longer have JS fatigue because it would cost us nothing to move from one framework to another. We could just like be using the current framework in like 20, mm. 27 or whatever. And then someone else comes up with an idea. It's like, oh, you know what? Actually, there's like this other trick I can do with the internals of the diffing of the thing of the whatever. Like, I don't care, right? This is all internal, like mumbo jumbo to me. I'm just a UI developer. All of my ecosystem stuff is on mitosis. I can just, as long as that person creates a mitosis generator, I can now tap into the entire ecosystem that already exists and try this new web framework and see if it actually does a better job than the previous one. Yeah. Um, and then it just comes down to preference, right? Or maybe exactly. performance. But yeah. um, you guys are, I know, also doing other things to help with the performance issue. But it's like, if you like the spelt syntax, then you can write it in the spelt syntax. 100%. Yeah. Like it, <clears throat> it stops being about ecosystem, which is like, it, it's nice that so many people are building things. But if you think about it from like an ecosystem, like a web ecosystem perspective, it's a true shame that people are forced to pick a framework when they create something that they want to share for free with everybody else mm. like, and they probably feel that way too they get comes can you can i have this in like svelte can i have this in quick and solid it's like yeah we just need like five people to help us port it and maintain it at all times moving forward um so yeah yeah it's, maybe maybe that feature will arrive uh if i keep fixing all these mitosis books <laughs> So uh, let me ask you a question. So this is an open source project. So what is the like roadmap look like? Are you helping test features that the community is like implementing? Are you driving the feature set? How does that whole ecosystem work? Uh, good question. Uh, yeah, so obviously it's an open source project. All the code is online. We have uh, a decent amount of contributors like that have organically grown, people that have show an interest in both using mitosis and or contributing to it. Um, there are certain organizations that are starting to, to pick it up and use it for their uh, design systems. So that's kind of another mm -hmm. um, world where mitosis can be of huge help is big companies with design systems and different web teams using different stacks. Mm -hmm. So that's, <laughs> uh, we have people that's like, okay, we acquired like five new companies and each one has its own tech stack and we want a design system that's unified. So uh, we have folks like that and we have folks that just want to help out. Um, and we're kind of, I mean, the roadmap is just showing up organically. Uh, there's such a large surface area. We have over 12, 15 generators at this point because there's so many different types of things you want to generate. Um, and so the surface area is really large. We've solved like the vast majority of the fundamental challenges. There's maybe a couple left. And we're at a stage where at least for us, you know, whenever we encounter any problems in our SDK work, which is what drives our understanding of mitosis, that's when we go ahead and implement fixes, implement features. But we're also trying to help out other folks that are building it out. Um, yeah, we don't have like necessarily like a very rigid roadmap. We're just like building as we go um, and figuring out, like get, trying to get a better and better sense of which generators are working at what. Um, it's actually a bit of a, wow challenge to like understand what mitosis can currently do properly because 15 generators and they're all kind of doing things for different things and you need to have like very complex testing system to even know what mitosis still needs or what it already can do i'm gonna yeah, pause yeah go for it really quickly sorry because the notification is not coming through on StreamYard, and I don't see it in Twitch. Uh, but we had a raid from Cassidy Williams from Cassidy. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, Cassidy. Thank you for that. Um, for anybody that's joining from that raid, uh, this is our weekly episode of Compressed FM. And we have Sammy on from Builder.io to talk about mitosis, which is, we talked about this earlier, but like a, like a sub product or like an open source project from Builder.io. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. And we're just kind of going through and diving into some of the de details about um, how that works. So if you have questions, additional comments or anything, just make sure to throw those in the chat and we'll try to uh, try to bring those up and get them answered. Do you have a question, Amy, that you wanted to get I to? I did. Know? So 
see me brought up testing and so i just thought oh uh -oh. man so if you write your component and you have a test does mitosis also like convert that test for you in another language as well or another framework uh commonly requested feature um, <laughs> <laughs> i'm getting all the commonly requested mm -hmm. yeah, features. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have a good intuition for what what the people want um, <laughs> amy yeah, I mean, is the people <laughs> yeah, she, she the represents people. the people um yeah we currently that's not something we currently do uh we currently have been content with just the fact that you can kind of set up integration testing mm -hmm. like with something like playwright or puppeteer you can set that up in a way that it tests all of them but to actually go ahead and set up like component tests kind of like React has Enzyme, and then I don't know what other web frameworks have, but they all probably have an equivalent of it that kind of generates a small component and tests it. That's still something that we have to, to sort out. Um, but it comes out to the same idea of yeah, having to like just figure out what that is for each mm -hmm. and every single other component uh, web framework and then build the generators, but still on the to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, just let Amy build your to-do list for you. Um, okay, she's got it. <laughs> convert Amy, every question she does. has. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Whatever yeah we should occurs, uh, we should build an AI bot to oh, or man. a bot to listen to Amy talk, translate her notes, and then have the AI go and figure out what the to-do list is for whoever the guest is. I, in their I need AI to like prioritize that to-do list. So this is this oh, is going go. down a, a totally different rabbit hole, but I'm start I'm like wanting to experiment with ChatGPT more and more and. I just asked it some questions earlier that were super interesting. Like I asked it to give me a marketing plan for launching a course. And then I asked it to give me like an overview. So Amy, I haven't even told you this, but I like have decided I'm doing an Astro course next and got lots of feedback from people on which domain awesome. to pick. And I asked ChatGPT to give me an outline of like what a course would be with four different projects to build. And it's like, 80% very similar to what I came up with on my own, which is mind blowing. This is again, going on a totally separate tangent, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking to use this more and more to just like do everyday tasks for me and to tell me what to do. Nice. I, I've, I'm definitely somebody who's very pro copilot chat GPT. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you use copilot as well, but I've yes. been raving about it internally yeah. uh, at builder of like tweeting about it. Just, I mean, it hallucinates, kind of like that's, like, like, that's the term people use. It's kind of a weird term to use, but it sometimes just says things like, I don't, you totally missed the mark there. <laughs> uh, but with enough guidance and I think enough improvements, it just keeps on kind of hitting it in a way that's so, there's a certain satisfaction, like a dopamine rush of the AI solving the problem yeah. for you. They're like, oh God, yeah. Um, yeah. I've got ChatGPT to generate like an entire script for this messy thing I wanted to do and it just spit out the skeleton and then I had to make it, it used like an external API, like a like GitHub mm. API and it just kind of like pre-filled it. And like, okay, I can, okay, yeah, you missed work it with here that. and there. Yeah. I can, but this is a good like 30 lines to start with and yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like what, have like, it write your, your tests. It's good for there that There you go. Too. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. You could you have go. it write the features that Amy asks for. Well, that's what <laughs> I was Amy thinking. Just, yeah. <laughs> just an, an, an Amy AI that comes up with GitHub issues and another Sam yeah. AI that just reads the <laughs> and, Amy uh, AI issues and it's like, okay, here's a PR. And mm -hmm. I think I'd go haywire very quickly, but maybe maybe worth a try. So. Pretty, uh, yeah. Hassan at Vercel, doesn't he have a AI thing that writes your PRs for you? So there you go. Integrate with that. Is that what I know? He did like a big image thing that took mm -hmm. off recently. I forget I what exactly it one. was, but maybe I'm confusing his package with somebody else's. But I have seen one where they yeah. write your PRs for you. There's lots of really interesting stuff out there. Um, I, I'm curious going like away from ChatGPT back to like software <laughs> dev. Um, you kind of, yeah, no, uh, which I think this is all relevant, fun stuff, but. Um, you kind of mentioned earlier, Sammy, the idea of like nobody cares what the mumbo jumbo is like behind the scenes. I actually am curious, like for you specifically in your dev work, and, and it's because I can't quite wrap my head around this. What kind of code are you writing? Are you writing JavaScript tooling code? Are you writing framework code? I'm, I'm assuming it's more like you're writing code that translates from one thing to a framework. So you have to understand the framework for the output. Is the code in the middle that you write on a daily basis JavaScript? Is it something else? Like, what is the actual code that you that you write and work on? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so the the actual code that's in uh, Mitosis is in 
TypeScript, JavaScript. Okay. Um, the majority of that is, um, I mean, the bulk of that in the middle is a lot of transform. So Babel, Babel, mm -hmm. like parsers and transformers and all of that, that kind of take care of taking the input and making it to something like a JSON and then taking that JSON and converting it. Um, yeah, so the majority of it is just that. Uh, and the, yeah, I mean, the SDK code itself that's built on top of it is uh, like mitosis code, which is kind of like meta framework generator thingy. I don't know what to, what to call it, but uh, yeah, it's JavaScript, but a, a weird version of it. Uh, I kind of, I miss writing UIs. I haven't written just like a normal <laughs> UI component in a while because I'm doing all this stuff instead. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always think that's like really interesting. Um, cause you, you kind of like, you think about the, whatever our product is like from a consumer, from a developer perspective of like how I use it. But then I, I, I don't think we like pay a lot of attention sometimes. So like, what does it look like for the developer working on that? Like, what is, what is the actual code look like? What is that? Um, what is that process? So I think that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. And like for a lot of tools, we're seeing more, like for speed, we're seeing like developer tools often built with Rust and Go, and I think Zig is the the language behind um, Dino. And so there's these other languages. Any idea if there was ever like a config consideration for like a language outside of the JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem for that kind of work? Um, are you talking about like for mitosis or just for yeah, else? like for for the transformation code? I guess like in theory, it wouldn't have to be written in JavaScript, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but that's I guess like that's what we that's what we know. Uh, it's kind of yeah. like that's the tool that we that we're comfortable with. But it could totally be yeah, written with anything else. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, the tooling is all there already regarding like parsing JSX and doing all of that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I can tell you, like Quick, for example, its compiler slash like optimizer is the is the name we call it is written in. I want to say there's Rust in there. Okay. But yeah, you'd have to ask Manu, who's kind of like yeah. the, the genius behind all of that. But uh, yeah, I think there's there's a there's a there's a bit there's a bit of rust in there that's used yep. for uh, yep. you know because it is like more performant or more whatever. I'm not gonna pretend to know what the internals of it are. I, I leave the mumbo jumbo to the smarter people. Than me. <laughs> that's the only thing I say when I think about these other languages for build tools is just performance. It seems seems like it makes sense, and that's the reason. <laughs> Yeah, it feels irresponsible to use JavaScript for like these types of things. <laughs> but what do I but, know? Yeah, well, but you had a great point though of like, that's what we know, so that's what we build with. So unless mm -hmm. you actually hit the limitation of whatever the language or thing is, like that's such a big benefit of JavaScript is is the ubiquitousness. Ubiquitousness? Ubiquity. Uh, uh, no, ubiquity? Is ubiquity uh, a word? We'll figure this out. Somebody in the yeah. chat let us know or or tweet <laughs> us or something. Um, but the fact that JavaScript can be used all over the place is like one of the huge significant benefits of, of JavaScript. So I think that makes perfect sense in this use case of like, we were working on something that is completely ingrained in the JavaScript ecosystem. We are JavaScript developers. We're going to use JavaScript to also build the thing that we're working on. 100%. I mean, I think um, a lot of people, there's like that saying, like uh, when you have a hammer, everything is a nail. But mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that up to a certain point. Like uh, yeah. there was a conference talk by the creator of Ruby on Rails uh, a while back that I really touches on that and it make, makes a really good point. He means making it about Rails, but it's like Rails is really good at kind of doing everything, like taking care of magic for you up until so that you don't have to learn something until you need to. So it'll take care of like it'll have defaults yeah. for everything. I'll just until you realize, oh, I need to like customize this behavior a bit more, and then it kind of forces you to learn the thing that you need only when you need it. And I think having that approach in, like, as a software developer is crucial. Like, don't just start using the right tool that people talk about on the internet until you actually need it. Just use whatever you know if it, it's going to get the job done. Focus on just getting the job done versus constantly being like, oh, what, is, what should I be learning, though? Because mm -hmm. then you'll Absolutely. never get anything shipped. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Right there with you. There was a um, little bit of a change of topic. There was a, a soapbox title that you uh, submitted, which was talking about like software engineers juggling quality. This is kind of related to what we were just talking about, quality versus speed at work, like knowing when to write code quickly to get something out of the door versus when to be slow to be more rigorous. 
more testing, more thorough, more whatever it is. Um, what are some of your thoughts on like the balance of getting stuff done speed wise versus like taking your time when you need to for quality? Uh, yeah, it's something that I, I find it very intriguing. It always comes up on my mind. I think because at my previous job, the focus was more on quality. Whereas at Builder, I had to, to kind of adapt very quickly to, to shift my priorities towards speed while also maintaining quality. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's one of the most important challenges of a software engineer is this balance. Um, I don't think it's talked about enough. I don't think there's enough deep understanding of that tug of war. And it really depends on your environment. It depends on the company you're at, the team you're at, like the macroeconomic conditions. There's so many variables that kind of dictate what should I be focusing on the most today? Is it quality or is it speed? And it comes into this specific feature, the problem you're trying to solve. Some problems need quality, some problems need speed. Um, and I think it's a very, it's a strongly defining aspect of what kind of developer you end up becoming. Um, and it's, it's an interesting tug of war because when you focus on quality more and you do it right, that's how you up your game. That's how you can learn things by kind of moving more meticulously. That's when you like dive deeper and you can come out of whatever thing you built with a long-term improvement. Like now for life, you kind of know that you should do this this way or that way, or you have to like look things up and be meticulous. So you've learned more about the the web API or how the DOM works or how TypeScript generics work. But when you move with speed, you get things on faster, but you might not be actually picking things up as you go. Uh, it's, it's something that I don't think there's a straight answer to, but I think it's really important for people to acknowledge which where on the spectrum they are and to maybe realize that sometimes they need to shift and to be okay mm -hmm. shifting back and forth. Yeah. I think the most dangerous attitude is the one that's kind of like, Oh, it's all quality. This I, will it. Yeah. I will never move fast. I will never, because that's always leads to bad code. Or somebody who's like, I'm always going to move fast because shipping is the only thing that matters. Like, there's a time and place for every attitude, and those who will really succeed are the ones that can move fluidly across the spectrum. I really like that a lot. Yeah, and I think part of like part of becoming a more experienced developer is being able to recognize, recognize those different situations and articulate that. Cause working, working at a company, you get, you often as a developer get a lot of pressure from not developers saying we need to move faster. We need to ship this thing or they make commitments to other people to say, we're going to have this thing done in a week without consulting the developers. When like, this is a, a big, big pet peeve of mine is like the estimates for that stuff. Like one are just estimates. Like they, aren't firm commitments in my opinion but they should come from the people who are actually doing the work who actually mm -hmm. write the code and so i think as a developer there's like there's this incremental skill building and understanding of how code affects the things all the things that you just talked about and kind of picking and choosing and recommending what state we're in but also getting really comfortable with your voice as a developer to stand up for like hey you're asking us to ship this thing this week and that that doesn't make sense in this case because it's going to be more detrimental to us to have these bugs in production than it is for us to just delay by another week, et cetera. So I think that like increasing your technical capabilities and understanding, but also that ability to like advocate for what's right given the situation is is hugely important for developers kind of progressing in their careers. Yeah, fully agree. And um, I mean, you need a uh, supporting environment as well. You need a place that will give you some leeway, will not force you to be one way or another, um, kind of give you that, that flexibility to, to choose for yourself a little bit. Um, because at every single, every single line of code that you're writing, there's like, I mean, not maybe every single, but there's every 15 or 30 minutes of writing code, you have a crossroads where you're like, could do it this way. Or I could spend the extra few minutes because like, ah, I know deep down inside I should be going over there and doing the thing and refactoring the other thing. And it's like just the constant decision making. Um, yeah, you definitely over the years, you kind of shift your understanding of when do you take the faster path? When do you take the slower path? And when do you take a step back and reevaluate and decide I need to learn about this before I just get this thing out of the door? Well, some of it comes down to just also working with a good PM. If you have a good project manager that helps 
will help understand and help set the priority for right now we need to move fast and right now we can't afford to move slow. But even if the tone is set, like now we're moving fast, they also need to account for like we're say we might be saving time now, but we need to account for that time on the back end so that we can come back and clean up maybe some tech debt or some bugs that we introduced. So I think it's trying to figure out that right balance of when that time gets accounted for, because you have to account for it at some point, whether it's spread out all at once or together, front end, back end, you know, you mm -hmm. need, you need a team that's going to help support you in that. For sure, yeah. Or you can just not account for it, and then at some point it will account for itself. <laughs> That's always the an option. Day of reckoning will come. <laughs> exactly. Not necessarily the one we recommend, but definitely an option. <laughs> um, do you y'all want to move into picks and plugs section at the end? So Let's do it. In this section, we pick something that we've enjoyed, something we've read, watched, used, bought on Amazon is often what Amy and I do. Uh, and then just anything we want to plug from the community or uh, something we created, whatever it is. Um, Amy, are you comfortable? You sound oh, energetic. Yeah. Are you comfortable? Oh, yeah, I have a great one this week. I'm so excited about right. it. Um, so I'm going to pick an application called Daisy Disk. So you can just... If you're on a Mac, sorry, PC users, but you can download this onto your Mac from the app store. And what it does is it will scan your entire computer and tell you where your largest files and applications are. So I had an issue on my computer where um, I have a terabyte hard drive on my laptop and it had gotten down to 30 available gigs. <laughs> I was like, what happened? Where did this space go? And so I ran Daisy Disk and because it's a solid state, it probably took about 10 or 15 minutes to scan my entire computer. And it told me that I had like a two to 300 cache file for After Effects sitting on my hard oh. drive. And so I was able to quickly find where the problem was and go in and clear out all the cache for After Effects. And again, that freed up two to 300 gigs of space. And I can also go through and clean up other things, move stuff over to external storage, but it was just really great at being able to figure out where are the problematic areas of my hard drive, what stuff can I move off, and what can I clean up. So check it out, Daisy Disk. It's a fantastic app. It's really well designed as well. Um, and then for my plug, I'm actually going to plug the Learn, Build, Teach Discord server. So James is doing a lot of work just to help increase engagement, help people that are running into issues or learning new things. It's great for beginners and experts alike. So it's just a great community especially if you are a remote worker to be able to collaborate and talk to other developers. Love it. Cool. Um, Sammy, are you ready? Uh, I guess. Yeah. I can, I can go next if you want me to. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll go. Actually, go for it. Go for okay. It. All right. <laughs> uh, actually give me literally two seconds while I get the thing. Make sure all these cords will follow me around where I think they will. Um, and so, if you had wireless earbuds, you know. <laughs> you know oh, it wasn't that cord that I was worried about. <laughs> it was the cord on the camera. But I can unplug this and get it out of the way. So um, I have a another camera set up um, on like a, a arm, a mount arm on the side of my desk that I, in theory, use. I use it off and on, but in theory for like TikTok videos and stuff. And what's annoying is it has like the the three three quarter in, inch. What's the like the what do you call it? The screw on the bottom that screws in universally to uh, to everything. What do you call that? Like your tripod oh. mount. Yeah. What's the screw? There's like a specific name for the oh. like screw size or whatever, right? <laughs> mm, can't remember. Anyways, uh, it's like the thing that you screw into every accessory or whatever, but. The downside is like to put the camera on, you literally have to like spin the camera, which is expensive on this like knob to try to get it in there. And so I bought this quick release um, plate from Ulanzi. Ulanzi is my favorite you brand. You love them. For, <laughs> they're so good. Everything I get from them is absolutely incredible. <clears throat> so I bought this quick release um, clip from them. And so it like screws into the bottom of the camera. It's really tiny. And then uh, you put the other piece like on the mount on the arm and then you can just like snap this thing in. And there's lots of different quick release clips. Amy's shaking her head because I'm sure she uses a ton and she has some like 
on her backpack and stuff i think um <laughs> But anyway, I this has been like absolutely perfect because I have gone through and like taken down my entire desk setup, moved it in here, and I was like, oh, I don't feel like spinning this camera around. Then I realized I have the quick release clip, so I just like hold in the thing and pull it off, and it's really neat. And in theory, if I had multiple cameras or something, I could buy like more plates and just have them be super interchangeable. But I uh, forget what the cost was. I'll put a link uh, in the chat, and we'll have it in the show notes for people that are curious. Uh, but maybe it was, that's not the right link. Maybe it was like $30 or so. Um, super worth it. So it's really, really nice. And then uh, I will plug, I don't have, I don't have anything up yet, but I, I kind of have officially decided and, and publicly announced that I'll do a course on Astro, which is something I'm really excited about. So the domain that I'm going with that there's nothing there yet. Uh, I'm but you so can, excited. I you love a domain. To, I know you can start to pay attention is astrocourse.dev. The other option was the astrocourse.com because astrocourse.com was like $12,000, which fun fact, I'm not going to pay for them. <laughs> and uh <laughs> anyway fact. so yeah astrocourse.dev nothing there yet uh, but there should be some stuff uh coming there over the next couple of months so i'm really looking forward to to working on that so since you mentioned tripod plates i have a peak design tripod and they have a whole system so that's what you're mm -hmm. referring to there's yeah. a capture clip that they offer that you can hook onto a backpack strap which is great if you just want to like you're out and about and you want to kind of hold your camera or mount say like a GoPro on your backpack, but it's expensive. It's yeah. great quality. I love all the peak design stuff. So I'm so glad that you picked this because like, I don't have their system everywhere just because it is so expensive. Mm -hmm. And I love, love that idea of just the $30. Yeah. As you said, you Lonzi. Yeah. <clears throat> I, they're again, they're by far the best of these types of things yeah. for the price range that they're in. Mm -hmm. They're absolutely everything I get from them is, is incredible. So Cool. Um, cool. Sammy, are you, are you ready? I'll say about the Astro thing. I, I love Astro. I think Astro is a really cool, like just out of nowhere idea. I mean, to yeah. me, out of nowhere. Uh, I, I, I used it for like the new, my personal website that I put together sometime the last year. It's been Thanks. fascinating. Yeah. Just kind of yeah. also how it lets you just try out like every new web framework next to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in a way like a cool learning platform. Because it just lets you import and export and just, okay, here's a Svelte way of doing this. Here's a React way. Here's a quick way. Okay. So that's how they all kind of, that's how they all differ. And without having to spin up 10 different apps, you know, you can, so yeah. And also just for, for a personal website and a blog, it's, uh, it's pretty neat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so you could create a component, use mitosis to generate it 10 different ways and, and import render them various all. Various. Yes. <laughs> That's something that's in the works. Uh, someone in our, uh, one of our contributors has spent some time looking into that. And that's actually a really big part of kind of testing and kind of like storybooking. Oh, right? that's so awesome. it's like if you could get just an Astro page, like an Astro server yes. that imports every variant of the same component next to each other. That is brilliant. Test all of them at once. Um, it's definitely an idea that's out there that I, I might be possible. Amy's yeah. building quite a backlog. Uh, I, I know. Yeah. The Amy, she's, I swear, she's, she's on, it. on the like yeah. the intuition is just out of this world. <laughs> everything yeah. goes, everything she says, and she starts talking about, it, I'm like, oh god, yeah, I know. No. The issues One day. up. It's a lot of people. I are was, about it. I was thinking about your testing situation. <laughs> you can use the JavaScript testing library to test most of that stuff. The only difference would be how you're mounting those components. Mm -hmm. That would be like True. the biggest difference. It's Sounds just, like she's it might come down to just like, just like the one the one thing that renders the component would be like yeah. a different library. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll get to work, Amy, as soon as we're, <laughs> as soon as this podcast is done. I'll go through the list you just gave me. Now that Perfect. she's prioritizing. <laughs> oh, one. She's, she's the PM. She's I know. The PM. <laughs> one last thought I had, um, since we're like talking about stuff more is the same way Astro is cool for learning new stuff. I think uh, mitosis can be the exact same thing because you can write a basic component like in mitosis and then just go and look at what the output looks like in the in the editor in the browser to see how how components translate to different platforms. I meant to bring that up earlier, but I think that's a great learning experience mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean it's yeah, it's definitely like it's choosing a way to do it that is like easy to generate, but yeah, you can just go mitosis.builder.io and then Here's what mm -hmm. this, here's how you set context in like these five things. Here's how yeah. you, here's what a dynamic style looks like. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Just hit tap, 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 and you get to, a quick glimpse at how, mm -hmm. what the syntaxes look like. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. sure. Now we just need this for CSS. Is this another feature? <laughs> so you could write CSS and it would generate it as a CSS Sass module, SAS, tailwind. style components, tailwind. <laughs> I just, just used tailwind. Like, <laughs> I mean, Obviously. I yeah, I mean, that's that's what I've used so far. Because, you know, when you're switching yeah. between components and you're like, you have something like my toast, like, well, if I just use tailwind, it's going to work in all of them. Yes, yes. I'm, not that I'm having an opinion about, I guess, that I have it. yeah. It's dangerous. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're past the tailwind. Your opinion. The tailwind thing was like a few weeks ago. It's, yeah. it's probably another month until somebody says something again. <laughs> It'll happen though. Unless you just kicked it off. <laughs> right. Um, are you ready for your pick and plug now? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it might. It's gonna be very non-tech related. Cool. Uh, Perfect. This is the only. It's what's on my mind. Um, so one of the things that was on this, like something you've listened to, and I've been in like a deep. Linking Park throwback the past two weeks. Yes. So literally just want to tell people out there, go listen to Linkin Park. Yes. Uh, I forgot how amazing they are. And uh, I'm having a blast. I'm having a blast with it. Um, and that's that's my pick. That's all I have to say about it. It's I Yesterday I was listening to music that I really liked like 10 years ago. And I just love how music takes you back. And you can remember certain events based on songs that you hear and things like that. Just the memories that you associate with. Oh, yeah. With and I'm, I'm like singing along. I'm like shouting the lyrics. And <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm being told like, uh, I heard you singing the lyrics to Numb. And I just didn't want to disturb you. So I went downstairs. Because <laughs> you were having a good moment. And I just, I appreciate that. I wanted you to have it. Mm -hmm. Love um, that. Yeah. So so that's, that's, that's my pick. Uh, and I guess... My plug would be mitosis. Yes. Uh, check it out. Uh, if you find anything that interests you there, anything you want to try out, try it out. If you want to contribute, that would be amazing. We, as you can tell, we have quite the backlog, the backlog. that's <laughs> increasing by the minute. Um, and yeah, there's just so much. I mean, there's a lot of small things to do here and there. Uh, and I, I think it has a really cool opportunity to change the landscape. If things if things play out in a way where people start using it, which I really hope is the case, uh, so yeah, check out my process. And where can people find you online? Where can people find me online? They can find me on Twitter at uh, Sammy Jabber underscore because there's another Sammy Jabber that beat me to it about ten years ago. And Fame. yeah, yeah. So I guess that's the main place. And Sammy dot website. I got one of those website domains. Love it. Cool. Well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. This has been a blast. I love learning about new, exciting products. Uh, thank you also for everybody that is listening in uh, either through the podcast, through audio and or uh, through the stream and leaving comments and stuff. We really appreciate all the engagement. We will be back uh, next week with another episode. Uh, if you're listening on the podcast and you enjoyed the episode, make sure to leave rating and review to help other people find the podcast so we can continue to have on amazing guests like sammy so thank you one last time for coming on and that's all we got thank you so much guys for having me nailed it all right we're still live because we have this awkward thing where we like end oh, what's audio and then we're still gonna say, do you now, do but, this yet uh we can do it now uh francesco thanks for joining sorry we're like wrapping up now but appreciate it good to see you yeah i'm sure i'll see you on more stuff and then we're going to use our fancy um Banner, actually, let me queue up a, a raid. Who's on? So Clarkio's online. So let me queue that up on for our friends on uh, Twitch that is queued up. And then I'm going to take us out and put in our brand cover thing. Where is it? Somewhere. Banners. Oh, I no? got it. Brand. You got it. All right. And then I have to take us out. Thanks, everyone. We'll catch you later. <laughs>